I-9 verification process, um, which has always um, been um, a, a question for employers, what they do with these and where they keep them, shouldn't be in the core personnel file, um, and also create e-verify cases for new employees. So that has changed. Um, the USIS has also, as of September 27th, 2023, increase the maximum validity period for initial and renewal EAD authorizations. So the validity period um, maximum used to be two years um, for someone on an EAD. That has gone now to five years for people who are waiting for adjustment of status. Um, the, app, the period was also increased for refugees, patrolled, re paroled refugees, asylees, and recipients of withholding of removal. Um, USIS also announced it was reducing the EAD automatic extension period. So during the pandemic, if you had a, filed a timely application to extend your employment authorization and USIS was unable to timely process that, you're automatically extended for 540 days. That is reverted back to the 180 days. The change is not retroactive. So if your application was pending under the 540 day period, you still get the 540 days. So why are they doing this? Well, they are hoping that the five-year EAD validity process is going to reduce the number of 765 applications that it receives. So they will have less work with a longer period and may be able to be more timely. Um, and they are intending to reduce um, their backlog, backlog and hiring additional personnel and implementing process improvements. So, um, so we'll see if they get to this 30 day uh, processing goal um, from 540 days, oh yeah, over a year um, to 30 days. That's an ambitious goal, but I do hope they achieve it. This new artificial intelligence executive order um, and apparently President Biden has now made um, Kamala the czar of um, AI. So she has the border and now she has AI. So we'll see how this goes along. Um, so President Biden signed the executive order on October 30th, addressing safety and security for the development of artificial intelligence, establishing AI safety and security standards and directing various agencies to develop regulations. So under the Defense Production Act, um, the executive order requires companies that are developing any foundational model um, you know, of AI that could pose a serious risk to national security, national economic security, or national public health um, to notify the federal government when the training of the training to notify the federal government when training the model and to share the results of an all red team safety step. Test, sorry. The, um, the EO directs the National Institute of Standards and Security, NIST, um, should be there, not above, um, to develop rigorous standards for extensive red team testing to ensure safety before any public release of these I, um, EO, uh, AI tools like chat GPT, and that's still kind of scary. Um, and um, it directs the Department of Energy and Homeland Security to address AI and its system threats for critical infrastructure, including for chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and cyber risks, and directs agencies that are funding life science projects to develop strong new standards for biological synthesis screening, making federal funding a condition of compliance, and directing the Department of Commerce to develop guidance for content authentication and watermarking to clearly label AI-generated content. Um, calls on Congress to pass various legislation um, to strengthen privacy and security and to develop guidelines for agencies. Also, um, efforts on um, DEI that will apply um, guidance for landlords, federal benefit programs, federal contractors, um, the criminal justice system. So this um, e executive order really is trying to get into the meat of um, um, a lot of the dangers of um, artificial intelligence and also to study the principles um, for 
addressing worker um, displacement, um, labor standards, workplace equity, data collection, um, labor market impact. So, um, so we'll see what happens because this um, technology clearly um, is um, out ahead of any regulation. Um, and that is it. And it is nine o'clock. And that is a lot to digest um, in one session. So if you have questions, please um, feel free to um, reach out. Um, and there's a lot going on. And I'm sure there's just going to be um, more and more coming down the uh, pike on all of these issues. So um, thank you. And I'll turn back to Lisa. Thanks, Deborah. Um, on to our main presentation today. We just had a lot of uh, great info on that legal update. Next up, we have using hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs with Dr. Gleb Sapersky. Dr. Gleb Sapersky was lauded as the office whisperer and hybrid expert by the New York Times for helping leaders use hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs. He serves as a CEO of the Future of Work Consultancy Disaster Avoidance Experts. Dr. Gleb wrote the first book on returning to the office and leading hybrid teams after the pandemic and his bestseller, Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. He authored seven books in total and is best known for his global bestseller, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. His expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting, coaching, speaking, and training for Fortune 500 companies from Affleck to Xerox as well as over 15 years in academia as a behavioral scientist with eight years as a lecturer at UNC Chapel Hill and seven years as a professor at Ohio State. Dr. Gleb, this floor is yours. Thank you so much for that kind and presentation introduction. Really appreciate it, Lisa. Okay, everyone. So let's talk about how you can use hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while at the same time cutting costs. That's what the shape of the presentation will be about. We'll talk first of all, let me forecast it for you so you can know what you anticipate. The first thing we'll talk about is how we think and how we make decisions around hybrid work. What is the framing? What is our perspectives around hybrid work? Then we'll talk about the data. So a lot of research has come out around hybrid work. So we'll talk about the research, the data, so that you're fully informed around that. Then we'll talk about the kind of mistakes that leaders often make around hybrid work. And finally, we'll focus on best practices for hybrid work. So that's what you can anticipate. Anytime you have questions, just put them into the chat and I'll try to get to them throughout the presentation. And of course, we'll have some time at the end for questions as well. Okay, without further ado, let's talk about hybrid work best. Let's talk about hybrid work, what that looks like and how we can make good decisions, starting with the framing around hybrid work. Now, having this breakfast presentation, let's say you are going to go for lunch and you open up the fridge in your office break room if you're in the office or at home if you're working from home with the hybrid modality, and you see you have two options for ice cream. One that says contains 10% fat. Another says 90% fat-free. So 10% fat or 90% fat-free. Which of those sounds more appealing for you? 90% fat-free or 10% fat? Please go ahead and vote. So you should be able to see the Zoom poll on your screen. Please go ahead and vote which of those sounds more appealing to you. I see most folks voted. Let's give five more seconds for those who didn't vote yet. Please go ahead and vote if you didn't yet. Which of those ice creams? Okay, so we see the vast majority of us over 80% would prefer the 90% fat free. Under 20% would prefer the 10% fat. But if we think about it, 90% fat free 
by definition means it's 10% fat, right? And 10% fat means by definition, it's 90% fat free. However, we clearly have a preference, right? There's very, very obviously and clearly a preference. So what's going on here? Why do we have this clear preference? Well, it's due to a way we think, a way we perceive information called the framing effect. How the information is framed for us, how the information is presented to us fundamentally determines how we think about it and what the kind of decisions we make about it. So that is very important for us to realize. And thus, it's critical for you to think about what is your framing? What is your company framing? What is your leader's framing around hybrid work? The typical way that I see leaders framing hybrid work is a loss. In fact, there was a survey that came out about 10 days ago from KPMG, the global accounting firm, which showed that of all companies that had 500 plus million in revenue, 64% of CEOs would like to go back to full-time in-office work by 2026. So that's their aspiration. By 2026, they would like to go to full-time in-office work and they see hybrid work as a loss, as a big problem. And they don't see it as a disruption as an opportunity. If they saw it, reframed it as a disruption, they'd see it as a great opportunity. And if you really want to th think about hybrid work as a major opportunity to improve productivity and retention while at the same time cutting costs. And that's what allows smart and savvy leaders to seize competitive advantage. And that's where you want to be, focusing on competitive advantage. So watch out as part of doing so. Leaders really feel uncomfortable with hybrid work. I need to watch out for putting personal comfort ahead of the bottom line. You need to put aside default assumptions, habits, and preferences and focus on business objectives and outcomes rather than what might feel personally comfortable to you. And that's part of doing so is what we'll talk about is overcoming decision-making cognitive biases on the future of work and integrating best practices on innovative work arrangements. Now, let's talk about the data on hybrid work. But before we talk about the data, let's do another brief poll and see what kind of working style is the preferred working style for people on this video conference call. Do you prefer to be fully remote, one day in the office, two days in the office, three days in the office, four days in the office, or full-time, five days in the office? I see three quarters participated. Five more seconds. Share how often you'd like to be in the office. Okay, so we see that full time is who would want to be full time five days a week in the office is just over 10%, so 12%. Fully remote, we see, is about 20%, so definitely more. And then the plurality would like to be hybrid. So 38% would like to be some kind of, uh, I'm sorry, not 38%, 68% would like to be in some kind of hybrid modality. And the hybrid modality that's most popular is two days a week in the office, followed by three days a week in the office. So Clearly, most people would like to be in the office less than half the work week. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what broader surveys show. By the, um, I took major independent surveys by organizations like the Society for Human Resource Management, Gallup, Harvard Business School, that don't have any particular stake in outcomes. They show that 75 to 85% of workers don't want traditional office-centric work, depending on the survey. And here we see that on this, the people on this conference call, only 12% want traditional office-centric work. And we're talking about remote capable workers, which all of you are. 25 to 35% want full-time remote work. And this is, again, comparable to the people on the call, just a little bit higher. Of people on the call, 20% want full-time remote work. And 40 to 55% would leave their job if forced to come in full-time. So a lot of people, of course, don't want to be full-time in the office. And that's a problem for the CEOs who want to get 
for the 64 percent of ceos who want to get everyone back into the office full-time by 2026 over 70 percent are less likely to leave if offered substantial remote work and i think this probably resonates with the folks on this video conference call based on the results of the survey now we know that remote employees hybrid employees people who are working in a hybrid modality so employees who are hybrid working at home tend to be more productive over 55% report higher productivity, 15% report lower, 30% report the same, self-reported. But it's not only self-reported that we know this. We only also know this from monitoring software, where people working remotely are 5% more productive. And the Stanford University study showed that in my 2020, work, workers working remotely were 5% more productive. By May 2022, they became 9% more productive. Why did that increase in the remote working efficiency occur? Well, because in we learned how to work together remotely better. Companies invested into collaboration technology. Companies learned how to have more effective tools for and techniques for collaboration. People invested into their home offices. So they were able to work at home better than in May 2020, which was just a couple of months after the pandemic and all the major shutdowns. And it's not surprising that people would be more productive working at home, at least in their individual tasks, because at home, people can be much more focused and much less distracted by others working around them. That's a major reason why they're more productive. And of course, they don't have to do the commute. And we know that people are willing to devote something like about 40% of the time that they would have spent commuting to their work. So they are actually spending more time working when they are working from home. Also, they can align their energy more with their work. So they don't have to work simply from nine to five. Some people are morning doves and they prefer to wake up early and do some work in the morning. Some people are night owls. They prefer to wake up late and do some work in the evening. And so they can align their energy more effectively with their work. We know that people who are working a substantial amount of time remotely have better well-being. Over 75% feel less stressed over 70% report better well-being, and over 75% report feeling happier. Let's see. Okay, I saw there was a question from uh, coming in to me. How is productivity being measured? So productivity is measured, and this is focuses on individual productivity, not, collab not collaborative productivity. It measures productivity is measured by things like, let's say, lines of code written. So for example, there was a study of a major travel agency called trip.com. And as you can tell from the name, it's a major travel agency with over 35,000 staff. What it did was it collaborated with Stanford University on a randomized trial where it assigned half of the staff in its airfare and IT division to work in a hybrid modality. To, so with some flexibility and half of its staff to work in a full time in the office randomly, depending on the people with even numbered birthdays worked full time in the office, people with odd numbered birthdays worked in a hybrid modality. And what they found was that after six months, people who were working in a hybrid modality, the programmers wrote 4.4% more lines of code compared to people who were working in the office. So that's kind of one very important consequence. So clearly more productive, they got more output. They also had 33% better retention. 33%, so whoa, huge retention benefit. I mean, how much does it benefit? How much would it cost to have better retention? How What is the intervention that, that improves retention by 33%? This is a huge improvement. Of course, finding new people often costs from six to 12 months and training them up often costs from six to 12 months of somebody's salary. So if you don't have to replace people on that basis, if you have 33% better retention, you're saving a lot of money. So this is huge. Okay. Um, and somebody asked, well-being data happier. So mental health EOC reports, ADA claims gone up by 25%. So uh, somebody sent that message to me. By the way, you don't have to send the message directly to me, just send it to everyone. And the, in terms of mental health, ADA claims gone up, of course, ADA claims went up. We were in the pandemic and people have not been happier in the pandemic. 
So people overall, of course, people's mental health has been worsened by the pandemic. But the worst mental health problems are for remote capable workers who are forced to come to the office full time. So that is the worst mental health. It's also the least engaged. So the, the, those are the people who are least engaged and they show the worst engagement. They also show the worst retention, the worst productivity. So remote capable workers who are forced to be in the office full time have the worst outcomes. Okay, any other questions before I go on? Okay, don't seem to be any questions, let's go on. So let's talk about the kind of mistakes that I often see leaders make around hybrid work and remote work. And I've helped over two dozen companies and nonprofits figure out their uh, 20, uh, 26 by now, figure out their hybrid work strategies. And I've seen many mistakes made by leaders, especially in hybrid work. And this has to do with cognitive biases. So cognitive biases are the kinds of mistakes we make because of how our minds are wired. So our minds, unfortunately, are not wired for the modern world to connect as small squares in a Zoom screen. That's not what our minds are wired for. They're wired to be in the savanna environment, in that ancient savanna, when we lived in small groups of 50 people to 150 people, when we survived due to the fight or flight reflex, and when our environment was very precarious and we really didn't want any changes, any change was going to be dangerous. And so whenever there was a change, there was a strong push within us internally to get back to the previous status quo. And it's understandable. It's in that environment didn't change. It was only the major changes were spring, summer, fall, winter. So it was good to get back to a status quo if the situation changed. In the modern environment, we have many more disruptions. We have the disruption, let's say, the rise of the internet and the rise of smartphones, the rise of virtual video conferencing technology, the pandemic, the rise of generative AI, which we just talked about with the executive order and how that will play out, who knows? And of course, the rise of remote work. But many leaders are not prepared to adapt to this new situation just because of our intuitions. They're comfortable with the status quo and they're really pushing back to the previous status quo. Like we hear from those leaders, the CEOs of those companies that KPMG reported on. It, they're very comfortable with that status quo. They want that. They've been successful in that environment. And so they're downplaying major disruptions that are resulting from the pandemic and not realizing that this is going to be a huge problem for them. It will worsen productivity, it will worsen retention, and it will increase costs if they try to bring everyone back to the office full time. Another problem is called the empathy gap. In the Savannah environment, it was important for us to empathize and understand and appreciate the emotions of those from our tribe who had our predispositions and values, and to oppose those, to be hostile to those, to underestimate the emotions not value the emotions of those with other tribes, people who didn't share our predispositions. So there's a tendency to underestimate the emotions of other people's decisions, like the desires for flexibility and well-being after the pandemic. And we very clearly see that people's desires for flexibility and well-being increased greatly as a result of the pandemic. For example, there was a recent study from the Federal Bank of Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, which showed that people or are voluntarily working less time. So we see the workforce participation is actually a little bit higher than the before the pandemic. But people, especially surprisingly, educated males are spending less time working overall because they value well-being and flexibility more. They're spending less time working and voluntarily choosing to earn less money than they could. And that is a sign. That is a very important, clear sign of this value and leaders who are not appreciating this, they're underestimating this, they're making bad decisions about the future. So that's a problem for them. And finally, functional fixedness, functional fixedness. You might've heard about the hammer nail syndrome where there's a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, when you perceive one right way of functioning, when you learn how to lead in one setting, when you learn how to manage teams, how to collaborate together, how to innovate, you will tend to try to apply that 
to all contexts. So you perceive only one right way of functioning and there are many leaders who transposed office-based culture, office-based ways of leading, of managing on hybrid work and remote work. And that is a huge problem because you really need to have different ways of functioning, of leading, of managing teams, of collaborating in hybrid and remote settings. So there's a failure to adapt strategically to the new reality in which we find ourselves and an effort to go back to the previous reality, which circles back to the status quo bias, but this is a different issue. So these are the three biggest cognitive biases. And I'm curious, thinking about these cognitive biases, which of these do you think would be the biggest problem for your workplace? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, I see the large majority of folks participated. Let's give five more seconds. Share about the bias. Okay, so we see that functional fixedness is the biggest problem as identified by the attendees, followed closely by the status quo bias, and then a little bit further is the empathy gap. So good, identify these problems and bring back the information to your teams so that they know about this and can start addressing them. Great. Okay. Let's go on and talk about some best practices for addressing these problems so that you can seize competitive advantage in the future of work and not undercut it. So the best practice is clearly a team-led model. Of all the ways that you do hybrid work, a team-led model is clearly the best. It results in the highest engagement, in other words best productivity, best commitment by others. What is a team-led model? It means pushing down decision-making on hybrid work to the lowest level teams and helping them make the decision. The thing about hybrid work, it's really different from either full-time in-office work or full-time remote work, which those are very clear models. Hybrid work is much less clear. You can do it in many different ways. So here we need to figure out what is the best way. So how do we overcome that functional fixedness? How do we have the best practices for hybrid work? The team led model is the best approach. It's not the top level leader making the decision saying everyone comes in on Tuesday and Wednesday or whatever it might be. It's not going to be individuals making the decisions and just saying, I'm gonna come in whenever I want. The best approach is a team getting together. It's not also not your boss just directly telling you, you will come in on Wednesday and Thursday. The best approach is a team getting together of rank and file staff, so the lowest level teams, getting together and figuring out what works best for their needs and experimenting over time and changing and adapting over time based on what works best for their needs. And you can think of this, when you think of this, it kind of becomes clear, right? There are going to be some teams which depends on the roles, they will want to come in at a different time. So for example, engineers, software engineers will want to come in at the beginning of a sprint and the end of a sprint. So let's say sprint last two weeks, maybe they'll come in once a day for a couple of days at the beginning, a couple of days at the end of a sprint. If you have salespeople, I often see them wanting to come in more often two or three days because if they're doing more collaborative work with each other and backing each other up, but if they're doing more individual contributor, so just they don't really work together with each other and they just do outbound meetings and video conference calls and telephone calls, they might spend a lot more time at home and why come into the office or frequently if they're doing that. If you're going to do, let's say, something like 
architects. I've seen architects want to spend more time in the office because they want to work side by side and do some visual design work. So of course you want to figure out based on the role and the roles, people in different roles will want to come in at different times. So accountants, they will most frequently want to come in for a couple of days at the end of a month to work together with other accountants to close the books, but not come in the rest of the days and that's fine. Others, Criteria might include, let's say, teams that have more junior people will want to spend more time in the office to mentor them. People that teams that have mostly just senior contributors, well established ones, will maybe not want to spend more time in the office because they can use their time more effectively at home and not be as distracted in the office and they don't need to do that mentoring as much for other people on their team. So it really depends on the team and what they need. And that's why you want to push down the decision-making to that team level. Another uh, very important reason is that when you push decision-making down to the team level, people have mutual commitment. They have buy-in when they make the decision of coming in and they keep that commitment to each other with that positive peer pressure, that mutual commitment. So that is a very important component of what's going on there, why you want that team to make a decision. And what I see is that it's going to be hybrid first for the majority of team members and maybe a minority are going to be remote. So hybrid employees on average will come in one to two days in the office, but again, varying widely depending on the situation. And of course, they'll also coordinate with other teams if they need to work with other teams to coordinate on coming into the office. And then fully remote employees are generally going to be more individual contributors. And also people in IT definitely have more of a desire to work in the office. So on this video conference call, I did the poll and only 20% of the people want to work full-time remotely. Yesterday, I presented to an association of IT professionals, over 50% of the people, no, exactly 50% of the people wanted to work remotely. So full-time remotely. And you want to adopt best practices for hybrid and remote work arrangements. As part of though, you want to provide training on effective hybrid work, what to do at home and what to focus on in the office. This is a fundamentally important question, which many people don't get correct. So what do you want to do at home? You want to do your individual head down work, focused work, report writing, coding, analyzing. Those are better things to do at home. Then your asynchronous communication, your email messages, your Microsoft Teams messages, Slack messages, better to do at home. No need for you to do your individual work in the office. And then video conference calls, phone calls, there's no reason to come into the office and distract others when you're in a video conference call or be distracted by them. However, the things that you want to do in the office are more collaborative tasks that depend on more specially synchronous collaboration, more intense forms of collaboration. So let's say you want to make a decision. It's important to be collaborative and to build up trust when you're making a decision. And it's important to have full body language, read each other's body language, read each other's tone of voice, nuance. That's definitely better to do in the office. If a leader wants to convey strategy to their team members as part of this in more intense forms of synchronous collaboration and wants to see what people think about the strategy and get some feedback on it, that's a good thing to do in the office. So having that back and forth. So that's kind of group activities. One-on-one, -on -one, nuanced conversations. Most of these, of course, are fine to do virtually on video conference calls, but for more nuanced forms of conversation, like about performance evaluation or about resolving conflicts, those you may you definitely want to consider doing in the office because it's better to have full body language and building up trust in those settings. Then, so that's two. Then socializing and team bonding, definitely better to do in the office for most people. People feel more engaged with each other if they do socializing and team bonding in the office. And that's free. And finally, mentoring and on-the-job training, onboarding, those are things that are best done in the office. Junior people, it's very valuable for them to build up relationships in that in-office environment and to build up trust because in order to, for effective mentoring, they need to have trust in order to ask quote unquote, dumb questions and to acknowledge vulnerabilities and an ability to do something. That's very valuable. So those are things that are better done in the office. And you want to train people on that and you want to manage people around that and you want to set up formal programs around that. And you want to do effective virtual communication and collaboration. So many teams, so many organizations 
did communication collaboration training before the pandemic. And I'm shocked by how few do effective communication and collaboration training in how to do them virtually. Because of course, it's much more difficult to do hybrid and remote communication and collaboration, but so few people, so few teams do those. Now, I want to share with you an example of someone who adopted this team-led model approach. So this is Craig Knobloch. He is the executive director of the Information Sciences Institute, which is an artificial intelligence and cybersecurity institute at the University of Southern California. There's over 300 staff. So people who are in AI, cybersecurity, very important fields, and of course, getting more important by the day. And he will, he will share about his experience with his 300 people staff research institute about adopting this team-led model. Uh, Gleb Zabersky came came to my attention sometime back during the pandemic when uh, I was planning to have our research institute uh, follow the standard path that all the big corporations are following. So Apple and Google were announcing plans to have people come back three days a week. So I thought that seems like a good plan. So we actually sent out a message said, okay, starting this date, everyone's coming back three days a week uh, and then you know can work from home two days a week. Uh, and and then I saw a video that Gleb actually uh, a video talk that Gleb actually gave for IEEE uh, that really actually changed my mind about this. And it was a video about hybrid work and how important it was to actually embrace it. And uh, uh, and one of the things I was impressed in the video is that all these interesting ideas about how to make hybrid work more effective and stuff. So I signed up for a meeting with Gleb and. Uh, uh, learned quite a bit more about, you know, how to do hybrid work well. And so Gleb has come on as a consultant for the Information Science Institute and has been really helpful in terms of putting us much more in a leadership position in terms of figuring out how to do hybrid work. So we changed our policies. We are much more flexible about who can work at home and, and allowing people to work from home, you know, whatever makes sense with respect to their supervisor, uh, creating spaces in people's home offices, uh, figuring out how to onboard people in a way that, you know, when people haven't met in person, that is more effective. Uh, so I think he's been incredibly helpful in terms of really transitioning us to be a, sort of a lead in, in how we manage hybrid work at the, at the Institute. So it's been incredibly useful with all of Club's advice, and I appreciate all the help he's given us with respect to moving forward with this, our hybrid work plans. Okay, now keeping that in mind, I'm curious about your thoughts on adopting this team-led approach into your own organization. What are your thoughts on the benefits that could be there? How valuable might it be? And uh, something that I forgot to mention is that Craig Knobloch, in terms of what it means to be a leader in hybrid work, the New York Times wrote of a major article about their hybrid work model at the Information Sciences Institute. So I put it into the chat. You can take a look at that and their success in hybrid work. So what that means. Okay, let's give five more seconds. Please go ahead and share what you think about this team led approach. Great, so over a third would find it highly valuable. That's excellent. And the large majority of the rest would find it moderately valuable. So it's an opportunity for you to take whatever elements of it you think would be most valuable and adopt it into your teams. Great. Okay. Let's go on to talk about some more specific techniques within this broad model. One is technique that has to do with collaboration. So we got a question earlier about how do you have effective collaboration when you're working in a hybrid modality or in a remote modality? So there's a way to address 
this issue through virtual co-working, which is a way of replacing the in-person co-working that you would do in an open office or with cubicles with a form, video virtual form of this co-working. So you work alongside your team members on a video conference call. So that's what it means. Everyone, it's a video conference call, much like this one, you dial into it. It's for fully virtual teams for every day or hybrid teams and non-office days. So you sign into one hour video conference call and you start just by sharing the project on which you'll work during this time. So take 10 to 15 to 20 seconds, everyone goes around. And this is for a six to eight people team, those rank and file teams. So just share what you'll work on. And then you turn off your microphones, you leave your speakers on and your videos option. So I see some, most people here have put their videos on, some people don't, it just depends on your preferences. Then you work on your individual tasks. This is not for collaborative tasks, but once you have questions on your task or you have innovation ideas or you want a problem to solve, you turn on your microphone and share. And what I, what I generally see people do is that they save their work, the time that they spend for this time, they save work on which they might have questions for other people. Let's say they're writing emails to clients and they have questions and want some advice and want some feedback on an email or something like that. Then team members can share the screens, give feedback, chat about the issue. Maybe they want to give some feedback on internal conversations or a project to work on. And you then, that finishes, that's so maybe goes on for a couple of minutes. And then you work for another five to 10 minutes until someone else has a question. You end by all turning on your microphones and sharing what you accomplished. This is very useful for, for helping teams bond, facilitating innovation and problem solving, and especially helpful for integrating junior team members. It's junior team members who will most often have questions during this time. So that's very helpful. So Samantha Knight has a question. How do you address the in-person bias in conference call? It has people both in-person and remote. So for this video conference call, it wouldn't be a problem because everyone would be signing in from their laptop. Even if they're in person, they would be signing in for a video conference call if they happen to be in the office. And generally speaking, again, if you're adopting a team-led model, you would only have people who are on a team coming into the office on the same days. So you wouldn't have problems in this. It's, a, it's for a team and having people in the office, would be if everyone's in the office, you don't need to do this. And if everyone's out of the office, you don't have any people who would be in the office. If you happen to have people in the office for some reason, others out, then everyone just signs into from their laptop. You're not signing in from the same room. Now, what do you think of this approach for your own needs? How valuable do you think it would be for you and your team to integrate this technique into your workplace? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, most people voted, five more seconds. Go ahead. If you haven't voted yet. Okay, great. So we'd find that just under a third, it's a little bit less popular than the, than the team-led model, just over a quarter and then their third find highly valuable, then over half would find it moderately valuable. So great, take the aspects of it that you would find valuable and go ahead and adopt them however you'd like. Great. Now, 
let's talk about another aspect of an effective hybrid work, addressing burnout and proximity bias through a technique of excellence from anywhere. Now, proximity bias has to do with something the previous Samantha asked, which is a worry by people who are hybrid and remote about career advancement. And also envy by people who are in the office about fully hybrid and remote workers. So how do you address that? Well, you want a culture of excellence from anywhere, which focuses on outputs, on deliverables. So you really wanna focus on those instead of inputs and where you work. And this was a big change from the previous culture and evaluation by managers of management by walking around and seeing whether people are working. So you really need to focus on outputs and deliverables. It helps address envy because it's not about location, it's about outcomes. So if you need to be on the in the office to get your outcome met, then you need to be in the office. If you don't need to be in the office, you don't need to be in the office. It's just about the outcome, not where you work. And it helps address burnout because it, it focuses on what you do, not how and where you do it. So again, focusing on that outcome. And it helps provide performance management with a focus on predetermined weekly or biweekly or monthly goals through small scale performance evaluations. That involves going away from that once annual performance evaluation only, or that would be still an element, but it would be complemented by frequent small scale performance evaluations. Once a week, once every two weeks, once a month, whatever works best. And generally the more junior people, it would be better to do them weekly, people who are more established, once every two weeks, people who are really senior, once a month or, be on, or in management positions. What you, it's really helpful for team members to know where they stand and giving them psychological safety, which of course improves their sense of connection to the manager and that improves their retention and career growth. And it prevents hybrid workers from overworking due to burnout and having burnout due to anxiety around their place. Now, what that means is that at your one-on-one, -on -one, the team member and the supervisor agree on three to five weekly goals, which you tie to your broader KPIs, OKRs, whatever you happen to use. KPIs is key performance indicators, OKRs is objectives and key results. Now the team member, 24 hours before the next one-on-one, -on -one, the team member sends the supervisor a report on accomplishing goals, solving problems, and a self-evaluation. And then at the one-on-one, -on -one, the team member's performance is evaluated by the supervisor. The supervisor coaches them on problem solving and then affirms or revises the evaluation and sets goals for the next week. So. This is a really useful technique to make sure that you have effective performance management and evaluation in hybrid and remote work, replacing the traditional management by walking around and the once annual performance evaluation. Now, thinking about this, how valuable do you think would be for you to adapt this technique into your organization? Please go ahead and vote. The about 60% of the people participated. Good. 10 more seconds, still a little bit of time. Go ahead to participate. Okay, so we see this is more popular, which is great. So over a third would find highly valuable and the large majority of the rest would find moderately valuable. Great, so this is an opportunity for you to take it. It's easy to integrate and complements your existing systems. Wonderful, great. Okay, now let me share with you um, the key takeaways. So key takeaways, integrating, addressing decision-making cognitive biases into your culture to make sure that you optimize business outcomes and the future of work, despite some personal discomforts and that your leaders do so as well. Use a team-led hybrid first model with a minority fully remote to retain the best talent, improve productivity and measure, manage, maximize well-being, address burnout and lower costs. Adapt your culture to hybrid and remote work. So make sure that you have training on effective hybrid work 
what you do at home, what to do in the office, and effective communication and collaboration. Integrate virtual co-working for effective collaboration, team bonding, and integrating junior staff, and address proximity bias, burnout, and performance management through a culture of excellence from anywhere, and weekly performance evaluations. Now it's up to you. I want you to go out and make it happen, and I'll share the experience of someone who did. I think this will be helpful for you as well. So let me share the screen. So this is Susan Winchester. She's the Chief Human Resource Officer at Applied Materials, which is a Fortune 200 high-tech manufacturing company. It's a, it has about over 30,000 staff, and she'll share about using all of these methods in her company. Hi, I'm Susan Winchester, and it's my delight and pleasure to tell you a little bit about our experience with Dr. Gleb. He had a big positive impact at Applied Materials. Our leaders and engineers love data-based, research-based insights which is exactly what he brings. He hit it out of the park. And he used a team-led process, which was incredibly engaging. He introduced us to a concept he created called asynchronous brainstorming. It was a process that we used with hundreds and hundreds of leaders globally at the same time. We did this during our CEO kickoff session for our strategy work. And in a very short amount of time, we were able to get great benefits. I also love the work he's doing to educate leaders around the power and positive benefits of hybrid and virtual working. And one of his techniques that I'm planning to use, because I think it's so cool, is what he calls virtual co-working, where you and as many work co-workers, colleagues as you'd like, create a virtual meeting and no purpose or agenda, but rather just to be working with one another. So I highly endorse Dr. Gleb's work, love him. Okay, great. So I hope that was illuminating and I'll be happy to take any questions about any aspects of this presentation at the stage. You can put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask. Oh, uh, I should mention that I'll send you some free additional resources, a copy of my best-selling book, Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams, and a free coaching session for the first three claimants. So don't, if you are, watching this on the recording, make sure to in input the information into tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. But if you're here registered, I'll send it to you without problem. So again, otherwise just put in, if you're watching so the recording, put in the information to tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. Okay, let's take a look at the questions. Uh, so Mariana, you'll get a copy of my book that has a lot of resources for how to be engaged while remote and hybrid. Anak asks, you know that workers want to, you're welcome, Marianne, Marina. Oh, Anak asks, you know that workers want to work less time, focusing on productivity, doing more work. We're finding increased burnout as a result. Any suggestions? So the key to address burnout is to set guidelines and expectations for when people are available and their communication, because one of the biggest problems is that people feel like they need to be available at more times around the clock. And that's a huge problem. And I talk about that in my book, how to set boundaries and expectations. That is very, very important. Another one is to have these small scale frequent performance evaluations. So people know where they stand at all times. If they know where they stand, they will not have that nearly as much burnout and overworking because they will know where they are and they can work in accordance with where they want to be in their career. You know, some people want to advance high up and they will be working more and longer hours to advance. Some people will not and they'll be fine with where they are right now and that's fine for them. So people really need to have that knowledge. And if they know, then they will not be nearly as burned out. Samantha, you're welcome. I'm glad to hear it's very timely for you. Any other questions? Anak, you're welcome. Five more seconds, ask any questions.
You're very, you're very welcome. Kim, Marina, John. Yep, you'll get a copy of the book and the slide deck. So that was that will be helpful for you to absorb it. Cheryl, you're welcome. Okay, Lisa, you want to finish us out? Yes, absolutely. Um, that was great, very insightful. Thanks for a great presentation. We're finishing up a little bit early here today. So I want to thank Dr. Gleb and thanks to everyone for being here with us today. Don't forget to check out our website, gmvhra.org. Register for our December 7th, making your company's financial benefits more beneficial with um, Michael Skodas, as well as events that we have posted into the new year. Um, if nobody has any additional questions, then I want to thank everyone. Have a great month and have a very happy Thanksgiving. And we will see you all the first Thursday of December. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Bye. Dr. Gleb. You're welcome.